This week on Vaticano, Pope Francis invites young people to participate in preparations for the Synod of Bishops. We introduce you to Monsignor Melchor Sanchez from the Vatican Sports and Faith Department, who led the Holy See delegation to the Olympic Games. Stay with us to discover and learn about sacred art in Elsa Giuliani's stained glass lab in Rome. For this and all the Pope's recent activities, Vaticano starts now. Before the Angelus prayer, the Holy Father explained the passage from the Gospel of St. Mark, where the evangelist describes the temptations Jesus encountered in the desert. Pope Francis said that during this time of Lent, we're also invited to face evil and to defeat it in our daily lives. It is a time for penitence, but it is not a time of sadness, of mourning. It's a joyous and serious commitment that we take to strip ourselves of our selfishness, of the old man, and to renew ourselves according to the grace of our baptism. After the prayer, Pope Francis announced that from the 19th to the 24th of March, some 300 young people will come to Rome to share their concerns, hopes and expectations of what the Church can provide for today's youth. I strongly wish that all of our youngsters can live this preparation as protagonists. As a consequence, they can have their say on the Internet in linguistic groups moderated by other youngsters. Cardinal Lorenzo Baldisseri says that this meeting will be a great opportunity for the Church to listen to young people and to give them answers. Every uh, youth, uh, young people likes to be uh, happy and then the to, um, to find the way to be happy. And then uh, this uh, means for them this they are looking for and uh, why not uh, the church uh, come give this uh, answer, the, 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 deeper, the deep answer. Uh, of the year uh, of, uh, of uh, their life. To communicate better with young people, the organizers launched a website and took to social media platforms. To highlight this, a summary of all the responses of their Facebook group will be included in the draft document of the final conclusions of the synodal work, which will then be presented to the Holy Father. Seminarians and staff from the Maronite College of Rome met with Pope Francis at the Apostolic Palace at the Vatican. The Holy Father's speech to them addressed two main themes, the work of accomplishing peace in the world and dedicating time to care for and nurture young people. Helped by your knowledge, work to ensure that Lebanon always corresponds to its vocation of being a light for the peoples of the region and a sign of peace that comes from God. At the conclusion of the audience, the Pope was presented with the statue and relics of St. Marin. The Maronites are one of the principal ethno-religious groups in Lebanon. Pope Francis met with the clergy of the Diocese of Rome for the traditional gathering at the beginning of Lent. The assembly took place at Rome's Archbasilica of St. John Lateran. Before the catechesis, the Holy Father listened to confessions and then held the meeting behind closed doors. This moment, together with the clergy at the beginning of Lent, originally introduced by Pope Francis, has now become an annual tradition. Mr. Bik Man Lee, ambassador of Korea to the Holy See, represented his letters of credence to Pope Francis. As a gift, the ambassador gave a Korean representation of the Virgin Mary, undoer of knots, to the Pope. Mr. Bik Man Lee is married and has two children. He has a degree in economics and communications, and besides his work experience in the Korean government, he used to be a Catholic missionary at the Catholic Catechetical Institute. The Holy Father received the Prime Minister of Bangladesh in private audience at the Vatican. Ms. Sheikh Hasina expressed her gratitude to the Pope for the recent apostolic trip to her country. The two leaders spoke about the Church's contribution to the country in the fields of education, promoting peace and welcoming refugees. The Holy Father thanked the Bangladeshi government for welcoming Rohingya Muslim refugees. During the exchange of gifts, the Bangladeshi leader presented an image of a boat believed to be carrying migrants. Pope Francis, in turn, gave Miss Hasina the Medal of Peace and a copy of his message for the World Day of Peace and his encyclical, Laudato Si. 
On the World Day of Reflection Against Human Trafficking, Pope Francis met with this delegation that includes actual survivors of the crime of human trafficking. The Holy Father said that despite a lot of discussion on the topic of trafficking, a great ignorance still remains. He also said that there is an unwillingness to face the full scale of the issue, as well as elements of hypocrisy, with many people involved to some extent as consumers in this chain. People's hypocrisy, society's hypocrisy. Jesus strongly condemns hypocrisy in the Gospels. The audience finished with a common photo and a prayer to the patron saint of the victims of human trafficking, Saint Josephine Bakita. Pope Francis met with members of the Synod of the Greek Melkite Catholic Church. Youssef Absi was appointed as their new patriarch by members of the Synod in June of last year in Lebanon. The Greek Melkite Catholic Church counts 1,700,000 people as faithful members, and it's one of the oldest churches in the Middle East. Pope Francis dedicated his prayers to Christians who live their faith in the midst of many daily trials. I sincerely hope that by their testimony of life, the Greek Melkite bishops and priests can encourage the faithful to remain in the land where divine providence wish them to be born. The Patriarch of the Greek Melkite Catholic Church presented the Pope with an ornamented chalice and paten. The Holy Father said that the following day he would celebrate Mass using this chalice. In return, the Pope gave Patriarch Absi a medallion of Our Lady of Tenderness. The following morning, Pope Francis celebrated the Mass of Apostolica Comunio, together with Patriarch Yusuf Absi. This Mass with our brother, Patriarch Yusuf, makes for Apostolic Communion. He's the father of a church, an ancient church, who's come to embrace Peter and say, I am in communion with Peter. That is the meaning of today's ceremony, the embrace of the father of an ancient church with Peter. The Melkite Church has Byzantine roots and liturgy, while it maintains communion with the Catholic Church of Rome. The church is most widespread in Syria, Jordan and Israel. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. Earlier this month, the Convention on the Rights of the Child took place here at the UN Geneva. Their main task is, through its committee, to review the reports submitted by the state's parties to the Convention. Alessandra Orla is the Secretary General of the International Catholic Child Bureau, BICE. BICE believes that the protection of children is based human on rights human rights that apply everyone, to everyone, including, including children. children. So why is it then necessary to have you know, special rights of children? Well, I wouldn't talk about special rights. It's more an engagement and a sense it's a call to adults to pay attention to this particular situation uh, where children are especially vulnerable, uh, especially I'm thinking about judiciary procedures, for example, uh, where the best interests of the child has to be taken into account. But child rights are human rights, and I think it's, it's, it's good enough if we stand with this. And, of course, as we should, being the Committee of the Rights of the Child, we are working directly with children. Children that are, uh, who are invited and come to our uh, pre-sessions, and children who give us uh, impact, writing us letters, giving us information, and so on. It is important, clearly, as the Convention states, to hear the voice of children, to involve them, to sensitize them, to raise them a culture of rights, in a way, conscious of rights, uh, and the respect, uh, solidarity, and respect for their, for their peers and, and for their family and for the school. Um, we need to have people prepared also to listen to the word of children, because um, this also happens in the judiciary. You know, how do you listen correctly to the word of a child? Also, there again, depending on, on his age, even more. Do you have some influence to shape the objectives of the committee of the wording of the text of the right of the child? Well, particularly in our case, I should say that the International Catholic Child Bureau was at the uh, part of the drafting of the convention because we were uh, really one of the pioneer NGOs in accompanying this process. So you really cause an impact, one could say. And um, 
when uh, when you make suggestions do you check uh, what the teachings of the church are well definitely we are guided by the church social teachings by the encyclicas uh, of the popes so um, and by the gospel at the end you know mm -hmm. which goes for us also hand in hand with development and with charity um, and uh, in doing that uh, uh, we, we we see that we have a space open to, to talk with delegates and experts and again as I said specifically in the convention the world spiritual moral dimension um, these are there, um, also thanks to the work of Catholic-inspired NGOs. From your you know, point of view, how, how does it look worldwide right now with the implementation of the right of the child? How does this look like at the moment? A culture of rights has been developed in this last 30 years. Um, did we succeed everywhere? No, there is there's still a long way to go. Um, there are cultural barriers also that we have to, to, to face um, and we have to also sensitize much uh, judiciary, children themselves, uh, teachers, parents to really create this um, what we call well-treating environment uh, because it's, that goes beyond the respect of the rights it, themselves but it really to create a way where living for children is appropriate, is adequate, is what we say in the jargon, it's child-friendly. The UN General Assembly ratified the rights of the child in 1990. Currently every member of the United Nations are part of it, except the United States, who signed but did only ratify two optional protocols. The involvement of children in armed conflict and on the sale of children, child prostitution and child pornography. Siamo davanti all'albergo dove si svolge la 132esima sessione olimpica del Comitato Olimpico Internazionale alla quale è stata invitata la Santa Sede. Monsignor Melchor Sanchez de Toca is the head of the Culture and Sport Department at the Vatican. The Monsignor led the Holy See delegation to the Olympic Games but also documented the event by creating a video blog so as to share this unique experience with everyone. C'è forse poca neve, molto sole e meno 20 gradi. To discover more about this new Vatican adventure, we caught up with the Monsignor on his return to Rome. It's a historical fact for the first time ever in the history of the Olympic movement um, and uh, a delegation of the Holy See of the Vatican has been invited to take part in the uh, Olympic session. The Olympic session is uh, the highest um, uh, expression of the Olympic movement, the, the corporate body which takes decisions regarding the Olympic agenda 2020 the election of new members, the seas of the uh, cities which will be hosting the Olympic Games, winter and summer, um, fighting against corruption, against doping and all the evils uh, which affect the sports. As a symbol of friendship, Monsignor Sanchez presented the president of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, with jerseys from Vatican Athletics. The initial reaction to the presence of a priest among the, uh, um, the members and participants at the Olympic session was that of surprise. It's not the, the kind of people you, you would expect at that meeting. However, after the initial surprise, everything was happy when, when they heard that I was the Vatican delegation. Holy See really doesn't mean anything for m many people, but the Vatican, eh, everyone knows what it, it is. Pope Francis is uh, recognized as a universal leader beyond the, the confessional borders of the Catholic Church. The traditional Olympic truce acquires special importance this year. Delegations from the two Koreas will march together under a single flag, and athletes will compete as a single team. This allows for hope in a world where conflicts can be resolved peacefully through dialogue and reciprocal respect 
as sport teaches us to do. For the first time in recent times, a joint delegation of athletes from North and South Korea marched together at the initial parade and the opening of the Olympic Games. I remember the um, emotion when the Korean delegation marching with the flag of the unified Korean Peninsula paraded in the stadium in a chilling evening. And the people that is usually reserved in the expression of their feelings uh, really was moved and expressed all the happiness and the, the, the joy for, for this uh, result. Per i 20 giorni che dureranno i giochi olimpici e costituisce un esempio di quello che potrebbe sembrare un mondo in pace. Paesi che sono opposti e che si fanno la guerra tra di loro qui invece vivono insieme. Qui ci sono dei contrincanti, non dei nemici. Ed è un bel simbolo, un piccolo gesto che apre alla speranza di un mondo che potrebbe essere certamente migliore. As President Bach, uh, of President of the Olympic Committee, said, sport cannot create peace, but small symbols like this can pave the way towards peace. Something that also was present in Pope Francis's message to the opening of the Olympic Games. We need small gestures, small symbols, that can help create peace. Qui gli atleti vivono, convivono, si allenano, si riposano, c'è anche un centro ricreativo e c'è persino il centro interconfessionale, uno spazio di preghiera. Per la parte cattolica c'è padre Francis Lem, un sacerdote dell'Arcidiocesi di Seoul, che è il cappellano cattolico della Villa Olimpica. Besides, I have to say that many Catholic IOC members were happy to have a priest, not just the um, Vatican representative, but, but the priest among them, to listen to them, to, to stay with them, and to, to celebrate Mass for them too. Questa sarebbe un po' la piazza del villaggio e da qui vediamo eh, gli alloggi delle diverse delegazioni. Vediamo per esempio la palazzina dove si trova la delegazione canadese, la più numerosa in assoluto, una delle più forti ai giochi olimpici e anche eh, quella degli italiani che occupano ben 5-6 piani. The interest and the, the, the engagement uh, of uh, the Vatican of Pope Francis with sport is, is um, I think, is part of the greater uh, mission and engagement of the Church with human uh, reality. Every dimension of human existence which is important for, for our fellow people has to be at the center of the Church's interest and, and her action. Faith has much in common with sport. They share the same values, like self-discipline, respect for others, honesty, and movement towards a goal. Through sports, people can learn and practice these values, and faith can inspire the sporting activity with meaning that goes beyond gold medals. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Hidden away in Trastevere, one of the most picturesque neighborhoods located in the heart of Rome, Vetrate d'Arte Giuliani is a place cherished by art lovers. Some of the most stunning stained glass windows in the Vatican originate from this tiny glass-making workshop. We went to Vetrate d'Arte Giuliani to witness how these masterpieces are made.
Elsa Giuliani is heiress of this fabulous family business. This glassworks was founded in 1900 by Giulio Cesare Giuliani, a chemist and pharmacist. He owned a pharmacy in the center of Rome, where the French embassy is currently located. He became so passionate about stained glass windows that he got in touch with Piccherini, another famous glass worker from that time and put his practice as a chemist into glass painting. He was so successful at his job that Mr. Piccherini left his workshop to him when he died. Vetrate d'Arte Giuliani started from there and has been successful in many parts of the world as a business handed down from father to son until the last Giuliani, my partner, Giulio Giuliani, who died in 1998. After his death, I took over the direction of the workshop. Elsa says that through the existence of the workshop, many important projects have been completed, both in Italy and abroad. And that for decades, even the pontifical coat of arms has been made here, but not yet for the current pope. Because he hadn't asked for it, because he is a very modest person and maybe has other things in mind. Anyway, we are thinking to give it as a present. Elsa says the success of Giuliani stained glass comes from the quality of the glass and the craftsmanship of their masters. This spectrum of colors contains around 1,100 different tones and it's blown in Germany. Alessia Catalo's special talent is painting on the glass. Right now, I'm painting Joseph who looks at Mary before putting the wedding ring on her hand. It's a beautiful process and quite determining for the final resort of the glass window, so the contours has to be perfect. Alessia's depiction of Joseph and Mary's marriage will be finished in a week and then each piece will be taken to the other side of the workshop, to this oven, and placed inside for 10 minutes at more than 1200 degrees. Once all the work is completed, a stained glass window will appear in a church in the north of Rome. Rome, the city known as the Open Air Museum, never ceases to amaze those who come to visit. This crossroads of civilizations offers visitors a unique experience through the history of mankind, from the classical age down to our own times. And the perfect example of how such different worlds can be combined into a harmonious balance is the Centrale Monte Martini. Located on the Via Ostiense Road, outside the Aurelian Walls, this former thermoelectric power plant has now been turned into an exceptional museum. Here, two diametrically opposed realities, classical and industrial archaeology, blend into a well-calibrated play of contrasts. Next to the old machines of the power plant in an almost surreal environment are ancient Roman sculptures and valuable archaeological finds discovered in the area since the end of the 19th century. In the heating room, visitors can also get a closer look at the huge monumental complexes of the Republican era and the imperial period of ancient Rome. And it is here, in this magical context, that the private train of Pope Pius IX has finally found a place. It's a masterpiece of mechanical engineering from the end of the 19th century. The train consists of three carriages. 
The first carriage, known as the balcony, was used as a loggia so the Pope could bless the crowds that gathered around the train while he was traveling through the Papal States. The second carriage, called the throne room, adjoined the balcony and was connected to it through a wrought iron small platform. This carriage was used as a meeting room and included a small private apartment for the Pope, covered in precious purple drapes and with a small private bathroom. The third and last carriage contained the private chapel of the pontiff. It was the most sumptuous of the three carriages, adorned with copper sculptures, frescoes, and paintings. In this, the Pope served mass during one of his trips. Pius IX was always aware of the importance of the railroad for the economic, social, and political development of the country. And it was indeed during his reign that the railroad network was built which connected Italy to the rest of Europe. In the year 1859, the Pope made his first trip from the station of Porta Maggiore in Rome to the station of Albano, about 15 miles south of Rome, near the Papal Summer Palace of Castel Gandolfo. When the Papal States were incorporated into the rest of Italy in 1870, the Pope King proclaimed himself prisoner of the Vatican, and his private train ended up in a depot of the railroad station of Rome, the capital of the newly formed Kingdom of Italy. After being stored in various places, Pius IX's train can be found today in what might very well be its natural habitat, the Centrale Monte Martini, where history, art, and mechanics all combine to create one of the most extraordinary museums of the capital. Join us next week on Vaticano and discover the spiritual center of the Roman Curia. Thanks for watching.